Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, The Steppe, and The Birth of the Russian Empire. And this is Episode 4, Into the Korgans Part 2, Sintashta. In the last episode, we looked at the Yamnaya horizon, the people that emerged in the steppe between the Urals and the Don, around 4000 BCE, whose culture probably formed the Proto-Indo-European homeland. Today, we are moving east of the Urals to look at the Sintashta culture of the southern Urals and the central Eurasian steppe. The Sintashta culture emerged from the Poltavka culture, Yamnaya herders who migrated eastwards around 2400 BCE in the southern Urals Kazakhstan steppe region. It subsequently developed into the Andronova culture, which encompassed a wide swathe of the Central Asian steppe at the same time as the Srubnaya culture was dominating the western steppe. Sintashta is the name of a river in Chelyabinsk region in the southern Urals. Minor finds had been made in the area in the 1960s, although not sufficient to propose the Sintashta culture as something distinct from Andronova. In the 1970s, plans were made to build a dam, which would have meant flooding the valley. Archaeological expeditions were assigned to investigate the territory before it was flooded which resulted in the discovery of a grave containing parts of chariots and bridles, potentially the oldest discovered in northern Eurasia. The lower part of the chariot wheels, spoked, not solid like the wheels of Yamnaya wagons, had been buried in the floor of the grave chamber, and the mud had preserved that part. In the 1980s, further excavations opened up a fortified settlement near the graves, followed by several other settlements of the same type, underlying later settlements. In June 1987, an archaeological team led by S. G. Batalov and S. Morsina from Chelyabinsk State University was carrying out routine work in the Arkaim Valley ahead of large-scale construction work on the dam beginning. Two schoolboys who'd been sent to work on the team Alexander Ezreal and Alexander Voronkov, discovered an area with unusual reliefs in the landscape. The archaeologists leading the team immediately knew they had discovered something important. Mobilising assistance from the wider academic community, including the director of the Hermitage Museum, they succeeded in having the flooding of the valley delayed for two years to enable excavation, the only time this had happened in Soviet history. Despite being joined by a number of other archaeologists, they had little hope of being able to study the whole site before it was flooded. However, while the departmental struggles were still unresolved, the Soviet Union fell, the dam was cancelled, and the new Russian Federation government designated the entire area a conservation zone. So work was able to continue, and is still continuing, on the Arkaim complex which consisted of a fortified settlement and two necropolises. What makes it unique is how well preserved it is. Unlike other Sintashta settlements, later settlements were not built over the top. It was abandoned by its inhabitants and preserved as a single archaeological layer, making it the most important find for the Sintashta culture. So what did they find here? The earliest part of the complex is a circular wall with radial buildings inside. Later, a second outer circle was built, with a wall 8 metres high and 5 metres thick, around 140 metres in diameter, with the total population reaching around 1,000 people. 27 of the houses remain, out of around 50 to 60 originally. They are of a trapezoid shape, with one end adjoining the circular walls and the side walls joining each other. A storm drainage system was built to handle rain and meltwater, 
which is claimed to be the oldest such system in the world. The buildings are timber, with clay facing, while the defensive works are earth reinforced with timber. The residential buildings are large, up to 180 square metres, with posts supporting the ceilings. They have ovens for cooking and heating, wells that could be used to keep things cool as well as for water, and furnaces for metalworking. There is an open space in the middle of the settlement, but so far archaeologists have not found anything in it. The settlement was an unprecedented find for the Bronze Age steppe. As mentioned in the last episode, there had been small settlements found at the western edge of the steppe, modern Ukraine, but nothing on this scale. There is little indication in the buildings of hierarchy or specialisation, so it is difficult to see much social differentiation or the early development of a city or civilization culture, which is not to say that there was none. Similar settlements at the western edge of the steppe seem to have just been people grouping together for mutual protection, rather than something organised under a ruler. However, the burial mounds for high-status individuals that have been discovered nearby would appear to be evidence of social hierarchy. It is still not known how the Sintashta buried ordinary people. They may have left the bodies exposed, which would not have left remains. There is some evidence of fire in the settlement, but not the human remains that would indicate it suffered a disaster. It appears that Arkaim was abandoned by its residents, who may have set it on fire as they left, perhaps to prevent rivals using it. The residents of Arkaim combined life in the settlement with mobile herding. Archaeologists believe that mobile groups would have taken care of the herds without actually being resident in the settlement. They raised horses and cattle, sheep and goats, but remains of pigs are rare. Pigs are only really suitable for a settled lifestyle and would not roam in herds to find seasonal foraging, so they are uncommon across the steppe. Archaeologists have come up short in their searches for seeds and pollen, so the Sintashta people did not have agriculture, although they did gather honey, nuts, berries, mushrooms and herbs. The teeth of the people buried at Arkaim show no signs of caries. Examination of their remains shows that their diet was primarily based on dairy products, with meat secondary. The Sintashta culture was named for a settlement found on the Sintashta River and excavated between 1972 and 1987. The river had washed half of it away, but the remaining fortified stronghold was unlike anything previously found in the steppe. The walls, gates and houses here and in Arkaim are far larger than any sites such as the Yamnaya settlements on the Don. Today, over 20 of these circular fortified settlements have been found. Weapons are commonly found in Sintashta graves. Over half of those with an identifiable male body contain weapons, compared to less than 10% of Yamnaya graves, which, along with the move to building fortified settlements, implies that raiding had become more common. No effective siege methods had been developed by the Bronze Age, so a solid wall with food and water inside would usually make a settlement impregnable. The Yamnaya culture and its offshoots between then and the Sintashta had sought out winter camping grounds in the marshy bottoms of river valleys where they could have access to fish and more abundant vegetation and the reeds growing up to three metres tall would provide protection. For those of you listening from temperate or warm climates who may be thinking that a marsh doesn't sound like a particularly pleasant place to spend the winter, Keep in mind that these marshes and rivers would freeze and become far easier to traverse in the winter than in the summer. Around the time that Sintashta forts were being built, 
2100 to 1800 BCE. The change in climate had reached peak dryness in the steppe. The forest retreated and the grasslands spread. Access to water would have become more important. It is likely that the forts and settlements, Sintashta and Arkaim, are both on the first terrace next to a river, were intended to secure access to winter resources. The remains of animal sacrifices in the Sintashta graves show that funeral feasts must have been very large. A pit nearby the graves at Sintashta contained the head and hooves of six horses, four cows and two rams in two rows facing each other across an overturned pot. This sacrifice could have provided over two and a half thousand kilograms of meat, enough to feed thousands. It has been estimated that 3,000 mandates would have been required to build the biggest Sintashta Kurgan, so the sacrificed food supply and the required labour for the funerary complex match up. The other cemeteries at Sintashta are smaller scale, so the sacrifices would most likely have been intended to provide for funeral feasting, raising the host's prestige through ostentatious display of wealth. Sacrifices of up to eight horses could have fed hundreds of people. The horse sacrifices of Sintashta were something new in steppe culture. In earlier Bronze Age burials, cattle and sheep bones were much more common than horses. At Sintashta and Arkaim, the graves contained almost twice as many horse bones as cattle, although in the settlement middens, horse accounted for only 13% of bones, compared to 60% for cattle. Horses were the most common sacrifice, and the proportion of horse bones in the graves is three times as high as in the settlement middens, which would have reflected their normal diet. Five groups of graves were found outside Sintashta. One group of graves comprised 40 rectangular pits without a corgan, containing stunning finds. Whole horse sacrifices, some with bone disc-shaped cheek pieces, chariots with spoked wheels, copper and bronze maces and daggers, flint and bone projectile heads, socketed spearheads, stone mace heads, ceramic pots, silver and gold ornaments. Most interestingly, the remains of chariots that they contained were dated to be the oldest ever found. The need to build fortifications shows that it was no longer sufficient protection to have a large number of people gathered together. Most likely, there was increased raiding, and this raiding led to innovations in defences and weapons. A chariot is different from a cart or wagon in that the purpose of a chariot is speed. There had already been war carts with solid wheels and a seated driver, lumbering into battle with archers riding behind. The chariot has two spoked wheels, a standing driver, horses controlled with bit and reins, and was ridden into combat at a gallop. Spoked wheels were a new level of sophistication. Recall the previous episode, where we discussed the construction of Yamnaya wagons. The solid wheels were made by connecting planks of wood together with dowels and reinforcing cross pieces, and then cut into a circle. They would have been extremely heavy, and rotational mass has a greater effect on the effort to move it, and therefore speed and acceleration, than the weight of what it is carrying. Making spoked wheels requires a much higher level of carpentry. Spokes and the multi-socketed central nave must be carved. The rim must be formed by bending wood. The joinery is much more advanced. The body of the chariot was also stripped to a minimum, eventually becoming merely a frame with wicker walls and leather strips used for the floor, which would have helped with shock absorption. Before the 1990s, it was thought that chariots were invented in the Near East, 
but finds since then show they were in the steppe earlier than that. The Sintashta chariots had wheels with 10 to 12 spokes ranging from 1 to 1.2 metres in diameter. Archaeologists believe that chariots were initially invented for racing during funeral celebrations, which is described in the Rig Vedas, before they were adopted as weapons, and there has been considerable discussion over the purpose of the chariots found at the Sintashta sites. I'm sure that many of you have seen images of ancient Near East chariot warriors with a driver and an archer side by side. Sometimes they even have a third crew member holding a shield. Obviously, having three people on board requires a certain amount of space, with a gauge of 1.5 metres usually considered the minimum necessary to give a platform of one metre for the crew. The remains of Egyptian chariots that have been found have a gauge of 1.5 to 1.8 metres. The Sintashta chariots mostly have a gauge of 1.2 to 1.3 metres. Too small for two riders, although a couple have been found at 1.4 and 1.6 metres, which would have been big enough. Some archaeologists argue that this size means that the Sintashta chariots were too small to be war chariots, and they were strictly ceremonial. But others argue that this is a red herring. Sintashta graves also contain large quantities of javelin heads, and the javelin, rather than the bow, could have been the preferred weapon of the steppe charioteers. A man in a chariot could hold the reins in one hand while throwing with the other. Compared to a man on horseback, and remember, this is before the invention of stirrups that would give the rider greater stability, a warrior in a chariot would be able to throw faster, harder and further, not to mention being able to carry a whole lot more javelins in case the first one missed. And another thing to remember is that this is before the composite bows that the Huns and Mongols would use to such devastating effect were invented. A Bronze Age step archer used a bow up to 1.5 metres long, meaning a right-handed archer would only be able to fire from the left side, leaving them vulnerable to charioteers approaching from the other side. Having a single charioteer also does not completely rule out using a bow. Romans and Etruscans would wrap the reins around their hips to free up both hands, so there is no reason a Sintashta warrior could not do the same. It is also significant that the chariots have all been found in graves with large numbers of weapons. Daggers, axes, maces, spearheads and javelin heads. All graves with chariots, where a determination could be made, contained a male body. If chariots are buried in warrior graves alongside their weapons, it seems reasonable to suppose that they are war chariots. The chariots were also accompanied by a new type of bridal cheekpiece, a bone or antler disc with a prong on the inside that would dig into the soft part of the horse's mouth when pulled and make it react faster than with a plain bridle. Bridles themselves were an important step technology. Elsewhere, oxen and asses were controlled by nose rings, which would have enabled much less fine control. The need for fast, precise manoeuvres also supports the idea that these were war chariots. So, if we think about what these war chariots imply, we can get a few more hints about Bronze Age step culture. Imagine driving one of these chariots. It's rigid, the ground is uneven, you may hit rocks, burrows or gullies, as well as thicker clumps of grass or plants that knock the wheels off course. There is no suspension or damping. The horses need to be individually controlled. To turn left, you need to haul in the left rein on the left horse while letting the right rein out. You need to do it with one hand while taking a javelin, aiming and throwing. Doing all that with any kind of effectiveness 
would demand a very high level of athleticism and considerable practice. And let's not forget that you wouldn't be able to hitch up just any horse. They would need to be trained too. The chariot itself would have to be made by a skilled artisan who had also undergone significant training. This means that although hierarchy may be difficult to distinguish in Archaim and other settlements archaeologically, an elite must have been forming. People who were able to dedicate themselves to training, practice and raiding, while still being able to procure the housing, food and whatever else they needed by purchase or in exchange for their protection. Historian Nicola de Cosmo says that this process led to the development of complex political structures towards the Iron Age, as intensifying warfare resulted in chiefs creating permanent bodyguards, which grew into armies, which then required the development of basic state organisations to organise, feed, reward and control. The Sintashta people also traded in goods. They had well-developed metallurgy, mainly arsenic or bronze, which they used to make jewellery, tools and weapons. Every house at Sintashta and Arkaim contained a furnace, crucibles and slag. It has even been suggested that copper and bronze making had a ritual significance and was one of the reasons the forts were built, to keep their work away from the prying eyes of outsiders. The Sintashta culture's position at the borders of the steppe would have brought them into contact with other cultures, forest foragers to the north, fellow pastoralist nomads on the steppe, and settled urban civilizations to the south. This doorway into the established Asian trading network would have helped to drive the expansion of metal production. A text dated to around 1700 BCE, preserved in the ancient city of Ur in modern Iraq, records the delivery of over 20,000 tonnes of copper in a single consignment. Ancient copper mines in the Urals show that thousands of tonnes of ore were mined. Research in other areas of the world has shown that periods of increased aridity drove increases in warfare and long-distance trade. As environmental pressures made it more difficult to continue increasing herd sizes, chiefs would look to increase their wealth and prestige through more intensive raiding and trade. We can see this process reflected in the Sintashta settlements. They are all fortified townships built alongside resources. All the Sintashta settlements discovered, even small ones with just six houses, have been fortified with a ditch, reinforced earth wall and palisade. They all have increased amounts of weapons in warrior graves, new kinds of weapons, and show industrial-scale production of tradable goods. We know that around the time the Sintashta culture appeared, there was a peak in aridity on the steppe, although it is not yet clear how much of an impact there was beyond the Urals. Pollen cores across Eurasia show a shift to a colder, drier climate around 2500 BCE, reaching a maximum between 2200 and 2000 BCE. This caused a reduction in forest across Eurasia, expansion of the steppe and desert, and colder, longer winters. The design of the Sintashta walled settlements, with the thick outer earthen wall and houses sharing dividing walls, could have helped to conserve heat. However, we can assume that the change in climate alone would not have been enough to make a people who had previously lived without any permanent settlements switch to building forts, which would have required considerable thought innovation and effort, which implies a significant increase in raiding and warfare as well, and so implies a significant increase in raiding and warfare as well. None of the Sintashta settlements are built in the kind of defensible spots you might expect to see them based on later forts. 
They are not on the top of hills, but right next to the river, usually in marshy land, showing the importance of access to winter fodder. As I've already mentioned, these marshes would have provided protection and resources during the winter, and as the climate got drier and colder, the marshy areas would have shrunk, pushing clans or tribes to try to lock down their patch and defend it against others. And some archaeological evidence for an increased level of warfare has been found. At Pepkino, in the forest steppe southwest of the Urals, a single kurgan has been found that contained the bodies of 28 young men. 18 of them had been decapitated. Others were missing limbs and had axe wounds to the head and torso. They were buried in a single kurgan without any women or children, likely indicating that this is the result of a battle rather than the massacre of a settlement. In recorded battles between tribal forces, deaths very rarely exceed 10%, typically being closer to 5%. So 28 dead in the Pepkino pit grave imply that there could have been 250 to 500 warriors fighting on their side in the battle, or maybe as many as a thousand fighters altogether. Sintashta graves also have a much higher content of weapon than earlier Kurgans. In the Poltavka, Katakum and Abasheva cultures that preceded Sintashta, it was unusual to bury someone with weapons. Based on excavations to date, only around 5-10% to of graves contained weapons. In contrast, 54% of adult Sintashta graves contain weapons. A huge increase. Increasing warfare would also drive an increase in the need for wealth to reward warriors and seal alliances. And so we see the noticeable increase in copper production and long distance trade. The walled towns of what is called the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex in Central Asia was a massive market for bronze, with records found of numerous shipments of hundreds and even thousands of kilos of copper. The long-distance trade routes from Central Asia to India and Mesopotamia were already well established by 2000 BCE. Steppe pottery begins to appear in archaeological finds in Central Asia between 2000 and 1700 BCE with even what appear to be a couple of steppe culture settlements near the Zerafshan River, which may have been trade outposts. Sintashta bits for a chariot team have been found in a grave in Tajikistan, and the first remains of mules showing bit wear on their teeth in Iran date from the same period. Along with bits, horses arrived from the steppe, with the earliest bones of horses also found in Iran from the same time. It has been suggested that the Sintashta may have specialised in horse breeding for trade. An isotope called 15N is found in high levels in meat from cattle and sheep, but at low levels in horses. The human bones from Sintashta sites show high levels of 15N, meaning that they rarely ate horse outside of their ritual feasts. Their chariots meant that they would have had well-developed breeding and training programs, and the obviously high status of horses in their rituals shows how important horses were to them. They were tied into the Eurasian trading routes, and horses were becoming highly desirable everywhere, so it would have been logical for them to export. Within a few hundred years, chariots would spread all along the trade routes from the Mediterranean to the Pacific. As archaeologist David Anthony says, quote, The chariot-driving Shang kings of China and the Mycenaean princes of Greece, contemporaries at opposite ends of the ancient world in about 1500 BCE, shared a common technological debt to the late Bronze Age herders of the Eurasian steppes. End quote. By 1600 BCE, the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex that was the steppe's main trade interface with the rest of the world 
was in steep decline, and the resulting interruption in trade led to the disappearance of the Sintashta culture. However, the boom in metalworking on the steppe continued, raising the use of metal throughout the steppe and forest zone as the succeeding Andronova and Srubnaya cultures developed. We have already mentioned how it is difficult to analyse social complexity in the Bronze Age steppe. What do we mean by that? We can see that climate change appeared to drive changes in behaviour from a purely mobile lifestyle to partially settled. The appearance of goods requiring skilled production and use. The appearance of goods requiring skilled production and use suggests that there must have been specialisation and the Kurgan graves show that there must have been elites. But this is not reflected in a hierarchical structure of the fortified settlements. By this we mean that if, for example, we look at a Bronze Age settlement in the Middle East, we might see that there is a big house that belonged to the chief, and then a couple of larger houses with storerooms that could have belonged to successful merchants, and so on down to tiny hovels on the edge of the village where the poorest would have lived. But in the Sintashta settlements, we see that the houses are all the same size and have the same amenities. So the traditional theory of differing social units making up a complex society in a strict hierarchy does not appear to fit the steppe, and this has probably contributed to an underestimation of steppe cultures over time. Although the fortified settlements and complex grave deposits are well preserved for archaeologists, there is as yet no real understanding of their social economic functioning. The Sintashta burials show that they had some kind of chief-like social and political institutions, while the existence of the fortified settlements with extensive metallurgical works shows that the forts acted as centres controlling resources around them, funneling them into the towns to be worked and then trading them on to other centres. But were they autonomous polities or part of a regional system? We have no way of telling. Numerous theories have been put forward to describe the Sintashta culture. It has been called a middle-scale society with a proto-city structure and social organisation, a simple chiefdom, a complex chiefdom, a proto-urban or proto-state society, and even a theocratic society. These theories point to the complex Sintashta cemeteries, with prestige items such as weapons and chariots, and large-scale animal sacrifices as evidence of hierarchy and complex structure. But not everyone agrees. Other scholars have argued that the variability in the grave contents and the uniformly egalitarian household types in the fortified settlements are evidence against the chiefdom theory. We do not even know whether the Sintashta fortified settlements are intended to protect them against other Sintashta or against an outside threat. Without written records, it may never be possible to tell how they really lived. The Sintashta culture has often been identified as the origin of the Indo-Iranian peoples. Their descendants would include the Scythians, Medes, Persians, Parthians and Alans, and down to the Gilaks, Kurds, Ossetians, Palmyris, Pashtuns and Tajiks of today. From the steppe, they and their successor cultures would spread into India through the Vedic culture, whose earliest surviving text, the Rig Veda, describes funeral ceremonies that appear to be very close to Sintashta practices, and into the Middle East, where they would become the ancestors of Persians and other Iranian peoples. So, for an ancient steppe culture, far away from the areas we usually think of as the cradles of civilization, and one that remains largely a mystery to us, the Sintashta has had an enormous impact on history. As David Anthony writes, quote, Innovations in transportation technology are among the most powerful causes of change in human social and political life. The introduction of the private automobile created suburbs, malls and superhighways, transformed heavy industry, 
generated a vast market for oil, polluted the atmosphere, scattered families across the map, and fashioned a powerful new way to express personal status and identity. The beginning of horseback riding, the invention of the heavy wagon and cart, and the development of the spoke-wheeled chariot had cumulative effects that unfolded more slowly, but eventually were equally profound. One of those effects was to transform Eurasia from a series of unconnected cultures into a single interacting system. So, at 1500 BCE, we arrive at something called Eurasia, in the form of trade and cultural exchange, from the western steppe to the Pacific Ocean. We will encounter a number of different conceptualizations of Eurasia over the course of this podcast. This is one I'm going to call Natural Eurasia. Just looking at a map of the world and seeing how steppe facilitates travel from east to west and back again, I think it is fair to say that a single interfacing system is what we should expect to see here, and it does not really need any explanation. What requires an explanation is how and why it came to be divided. Before we go, let's return to Archaim for a moment. As mentioned at the beginning of this episode, Archaim was excavated and investigated as the Soviet Union fell and the Russian Federation was created. A time of deep identity crisis for Russia. Many people thought that a new national idea to replace communism as communism had replaced orthodoxy, autocracy and nationality, the credo of the late Russian Empire, was essential. TV talk shows were full of pundits lamenting the absence of such an idea or proposing their own candidates. The discovery of a new culture, one that was building towns in the southern Urals before the pyramids were completed, who may have invented the chariot, captured the imagination of many opening up the possibility of a source of national identity and pride far older than Kievan Rus. Archaim was adopted as a symbol by conspiracy theorists claiming that the West was out to destroy Russia as it had always been, by Russian neo-Nazis who saw Indo-Aryan settlements in the Urals as proof that Russians were the true Aryans, and by romantics mythologizing Russia's ancient past. Tamara Glober, an astrologer and TV presenter, visited Arkham and claimed it was a place of power like Stonehenge, where people had gathered to read the stars, giving rise to a whole industry of charlatans making outlandish claims and turning Arkham into a place of pilgrimage for neo-pagans and lovers of the esoteric, with thousands turning up each year to celebrate the summer solstice. Even Vladimir Putin dropped by on a flying visit in the early 2000s when he was in the habit of visiting archaeological sites looking out for something that might inspire a national idea. Gennady Zdanovich, the archaeologist in charge at Arkham, came right out and proposed making it the new foundation of Russian identity. But apparently it just wasn't what Putin was looking for. Looking back in 2019, Zdanovich said, quote, We lost our national idea after the fall of the Soviet Union, and we still haven't found one. What's worst, we've got used to just living, without an idea, not knowing what we are defending, what we are living for, where the country is going. That is the main problem of Putin's Russia today. End quote. And then he recalled that Dmitry Medvedev, then Putin's chief of staff, said, We have lost Kievan Rus, so we're going to have to dig deeper. Zdanovich blamed Arkham's popularity with paranormal fantasists for the missed opportunity. And Medvedev is still out there, occasionally stopping by sites looking for inspiration. As I have mentioned previously, much of the archaeological work on Kurgans has been done or published only in the last 30 or 40 years. That is, these major discoveries of significant cultures and peoples in Russian territory have occurred in the post-Soviet period, when there has been a widespread search for a new identity in Russia. These discoveries, which appear to change the picture of Russia as somewhere on the periphery, 
where nothing of significance was happening, while civilization was born elsewhere, have naturally found a resonance. Especially as the obscure origins of the Slavs and foreign involvement in the formation of the Rus were already a source of somewhat ambivalent feelings. However, there is still too little known, and what is known about the Sintashta, for instance, is too linked to Indo-Iranians to be claimed as a Slavic origin story, leaving it for fringe theorists and mythologies rather than a real contribution to Russian identity. The Sintashta culture was succeeded by the Andronova culture, which emerged between the southern Urals and Kazakhstan and would eventually extend from the Caspian to Xinjiang. The archaeological record shows that they moved into the Middle East to become the precursors of the Persians and other Iranian peoples, while the linguistic record, as we discussed in episode 2, implies that they also migrated into India to give rise to Sanskrit. However, archaeological finds to support the so-called Aryan invasion of India have yet to be made. In the Pontic Caspian steppe, the related Iranian Srubnaya culture would develop from Yamnaya contemporaneously. However, our story is next going to jump forwards a few centuries once again to the first people of the steppe that we have written records for, the Scythians. But before we get into that, we're going to take a detour into where some of those written records come from and take a look at the Bosporan Kingdom and the Greek colonies at the northern shore of the Black Sea. The Pontic Greeks, as they are also known, will be the first people covered in this podcast who are still with us today. There are a couple of hundred thousand Greeks living in Russia and Ukraine, as well as other communities in other countries in the Black Sea Caucasus region. Check out the socials for maps and pictures to go with the episodes at the Russian Empire History Podcast on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Please follow or subscribe to the podcast at Spotify or the podcatcher of your choice and share with your friends. You can reach me through Facebook or at hello at the Russian Empire History Podcast dot com. Thank you for listening and I hope you will join me next time.